we, we've heard during this conflict that Ukrainian officials were talking about that they don't have a backup plan, a plan B for this conflict in Ukraine. And Zelensky in his recent interview with CNN said the same thing. No plan B for us. We want to fight it to the last Ukrainian. And do you think that the plan B for in this article in Asia Times is saying that U.S. US troops in Moldova is emerging plan B for Ukraine. Is there anything like a plan B, a backup plan for US troops to go in Odessa and attack Crimea? No, there's no plan B. Let's just stop the nonsense right now. America will never deploy troops to Ukraine. NATO will never deploy troops to Ukraine because to do so is instant death. NATO doesn't have the capacity to, to project power, meaningful power into Ukraine. It's going to take France months to get one brigade, 5,000 guys into Ukraine. They will all die within a week. Then there's nothing to back them up. What are we sending to Ukraine? This is stupidity in the extreme. The world needs to wake up to the fact that there is no plan B for Ukraine. Ukraine is going to die a miserable death, thanks to the West. It could stop the torture today by surrendering. But there will not be terms set forward. There's talk about a peace conference in Switzerland. To discuss what? If the Russians aren't at the table, you don't have a peace conference, do you? What is Europe trying to decide? The conditions under which what? The conflict will terminate? The conflict only terminates when Russia says we're done. Russia has the only vote that counts. And so the question is, are you going to do it the easy way or the hard way? The easy way is to give up now, save lives, save infrastructure. The hard way, Russia will terminate Ukraine. It is a done deal. The Russians have made it clear that there will not be a Zelensky regime when this is done. The Russians have made it clear that Western Ukraine will not be configured the way they are politically right now. The ultra-nationalists will be terminated. Banderism will be destroyed. There will be no residual neo-Nazi ideology allowed on Ukrainian soil. Now, if the Ukrainians play it smart, Russia may allow them to retain Odessa and Kharkov, but only, only if Ukraine is configured as a sovereign state that is part of a political economic union with Russia and Belarus. In that case, Russia has nothing to fear about Odessa or Kharkov. But if Ukraine wants to do it the hard way, then Russia will take over Odessa, take over Kharkov, and leave nothing but this pathetic occupied rump state, which has no economic viability and no sustainability as a nation state. It, Ukraine will never be a part of NATO. Ukraine will never be a member of the European Union. That is not in the cards for Ukraine. And let's be honest, the European Union never intended to bring Ukraine in. What are they bringing in? This basket case of a nation? Why would the European Union do that? They're throwing out promises, lying to the Ukrainians, dangling this carrot in front of them. But it, it, Ukraine will never be a member of the European Union, and they will never be a member of NATO. This is cruel and unusual punishment for Stoltenberg, Blinken, and others to talk about the potential. We're building a bridge to NATO membership. Well, let's call that bridge the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And it's been crumpled into the sea and it's not going to be rebuilt uh, for a long, long time, if ever. That's the reality. And, and that's where we're at right now. Ukraine has no future. Has no future. It's finished. Are we approaching the final days of this conflict? We're in the final. I mean, this conflict's been going on for two years. I don't believe it's going to go on for another year. Um, the Russians are accumulating overwhelming military power. And, uh, the, you know, they are uh, grinding the Ukrainians down to nothing. You know, if they, the, the faster Russia goes, the more casually Russia takes. Russia is not in the business of taking casualties right now. So Russia is just going to grind Ukraine down, grind it down, grind it down, and move in when there's nothing left. Um, and, but that's happening sooner rather than later. Ukraine is running out of everything. They have no air defense. So the Russians have the, you know, accumulated these glide bombs, these fab, um, you know, fab 250s, 500s, 1500s. Now we have fab 3000s coming in. And everybody acknowledges that the Russian Air Force now just comes in. There's nothing to shoot it down. They drop these bombs outside of any air defense range that the Ukrainians might have retained. And these bombs come in and kill everything. And then the Russian forces move forward a little bit. And then the Ukrainians fall back 
The bombs come in and kill everything. The Russians move forward a little bit, and Russia will play this game all day long. They have, unlike the West, which can't produce artillery shells, apparently, Russia is producing a lot of bombs, mass production of these bombs, and they're going to drop these bombs and they're going to kill every Ukrainian in front of them. That's the way this war is going to be fought. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be devastating for the Ukrainians. And there's nothing that can happen to change that. There is no plan B. How do you see the final days? Do you think it's, it's going to be the same way that it was during the Nazi Germany? No, the, the Russians in Nazi Germany, you know, look, the Battle of Berlin cost Russia 100,000 lives. Russia's not in the business of losing 100,000 lives. It's not going to be a fair fight. It's not going to be a standoff fight. The German army was a very capable army, even to the end. Highly disciplined troops, good weapons, uh, the ability to, to, as long as they maintain combat cohesion, they represented a threat to the Russians on a tactical level. The Ukrainians don't represent a threat to the Russians anymore. This is mass murder. You don't believe anything British intelligence says. A thousand Russians dying the day. The Russians are suffering the lowest level of casualties they have suffered in the entire conflict today because they have such overwhelming dominance on the battlefield. But again, their job isn't to take territory quickly at this time. Their job is just to kill Ukrainians. And they're doing that every single day while they're taking territory. So all the people that point the map said, well, it hasn't moved very much. Well, no, but the, there has been a lot of territorial, uh, you know, modifications. The cemeteries that the Ukrainians have to dig to bury the bodies that are recovered from the battlefield. So, you know, they, they just, it's, this is a tragedy, but it's a tragedy that the West foisted upon Ukraine. And Ukraine has made a decision. Now they're even talking about they're going to mobilize women. So, Ukraine is literally committing suicide as a nation state. When it comes to the confrontation, people who are so in favor of NATO and saying that NATO can crush Russia, NATO can do everything with Russia, it always comes to the mind that when we look at the NATO countries today, none of them had a serious experience in a real war. Correct me if I'm mistaken, because the only country that has experience in the war is the United States in the aftermath of the World War II, just the United States together with some countries within NATO. Most of these countries don't have any experience on the battlefield and don't know how does it work. And the, the other thing would be the nature of these wars that the United States fought so far that were totally different from what we've seen so far in Ukraine. First of all, let's just correct. The United States has no combat, relevant combat experience either. We just spent, you know, the average military career is what, 20 years? <laughs> you know, uh, well, 20 years ago was 2004. Uh, and we were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Low intensity conflict has no bearing on what's going on right now. And we haven't, we don't know how to fight modern war. We don't know how to fight. We're trying to retrain ourselves, but it takes time. Um, when they talk about NATO air power, I hear a lot of people going, well, look what we did to Kosovo, we being NATO. Well, go back and look at the NATO air campaign in Kosovo. It's, it's literally a case study in incompetence and ineffectiveness. Yes, they defeated a, 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 you know, a, a almost defenseless country, but the, the air campaign wasn't effective. It ended up killing a lot of civilians. It wasn't a good military campaign. Had the Serbians had a, a, an effective integrated air defense, um, they, NATO would have been defeated. NATO almost defeated itself because of sheer incompetence. Um, you know, that's the reality of the NATO air campaign. And yet people are going, look what we did. Look what they did to Libya. No air defense. And, you know, what they're proud of this. If NATO went up against Russia, a Russian air defense like this, it would be the end of NATO. Their air defense can't beat the Russians. They have no combat experience pilots. I saw the other day there was this uh, F-16 uh, pilot, Dan Hammond or something of that nature, you know, saying, I will volunteer to go in and help the things. And everybody's like, oh, God, he's the most experienced F-16 pilot in the world. He has no air-to-air -air combat experience. So how good is he going to be? And his combat experience is bombing defenseless nations. How good is he going to be? No, he'll die on the first hour too because he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's going to get up there in the airframe with that that is an F-16 that's not that good. Um, he's going to go up and the Russians are going to shoot it down. Um, or he's going to try and land an airfield that no longer exists. Um, 
I mean, the stupidity of these people uh, is, is beyond comprehension. Um, you know, we need to look at the cold, hard facts. Russia spent two years perfecting the art of modern warfare. And they're very good at it. Are they perfect? Nobody's perfect. Does Russia make mistakes? Everybody makes mistakes. But, you know, in, in, in the world of combat, first of all, understand that Russia knows now how to do an operation, take losses, adapt, and keep going. Um, they can take a punch. Nobody in the West knows that they can take a punch. Nobody in the West has been punched. Um, you know, so what happens when the West goes up against a fighter like Russia that hits it, maybe they knock the West out first punch. Maybe they don't, but now the West has to retreat to its corner. It's in a defensive stance. Russia's just going to pummel it all day long because Russia knows how to fight. They've trained for the fight. The, the West have been training for a one or two round skirmish. That's all we know how to do. Brigade sized element come in rapid, you know, air power, crush the enemy. That's it. Russia's training for the 15 round championship fight. They're ready for all 15 rounds. They're ready to be Muhammad Ali in the thrill of Manila taking George Foreman out, or I mean, Joe Frazier out in the 14th round because we're better. They're better than we are. They'll outlast us. They'll land punches. They'll beat the crap out of us. NATO's not ready for the fight. We've been on the couch. We've been eating. We've gotten fat. We're not training. Russia's training right now. What does NATO think they're going to do? I mean, you have these loud mouths who fought and fought in Kosovo, that's their big combat experience. And they're saying, oh, NATO oil power will turn things around. They couldn't win in Kosovo. They were incompetent in Kosovo. And now they want to take this incompetence that is NATO coalition warfare and apply it against the Russians. It's stupidity in the extreme. Whenever they're talking about the NATO confrontation with Russia, they're thinking that Russia would be alone. Do you think that at the end of the day, these countries like Belarus, like Iran, even China, do you think if something happens between Russia and NATO, these countries would stay silent and do nothing about it? Well, first of all, we know that Belarus will not stay silent. If, if NATO attacks Russia, Belarus is automatically in the fight. Um, you know, China just uh, had a meeting. Uh, the, Xi Jinping met with uh, Sergei Lavrov. And uh, the, 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 the statement made by the, China, I'd be the Chinese foreign minister uh, at the end of this meeting was that... Um, that while China and Russia will never conspire to attack a third nation, um, if NATO or uh, you know Western powers attack either Russia or China, they will come to their aid and fight for them on their behalf. Um, and they also said that Russia and China will come to the aid of nations uh, who you know who are subjected to attacks from the West that threaten international security. Um, look. This this means it's game set match. If NATO gets involved in, um, in 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 Ukraine, China will become involved. Now, does that mean that Chinese divisions are going to show up in Ukraine? No, it means China will attack American forces in the Pacific. But China will make available the total weight of its economic power against the United States. Janet, Janet Yellen just came from a meeting in China where she had to acknowledge the Chinese are just whooping up on us. Uh, we're so pathetic. They outcompete us. We, we, we have to get the Chinese to change the way because we can't compete with the Chinese. Their, their market share is too big. Uh, their consumer base is too strong. We can't compete with it. They produce things too cheaply. Da, da, da. Basically, China out capital, you know, <laughs> is a better capitalist nation apparently than the United States is. Um, China will crush the American economy, crush the global economy. Uh, China will always guarantee that there's a market for Russia so that Russia can withstand any sanctions that go against it. Um, and Russia will not leave China alone if the United States moves in on Taiwan. Uh, remember, Japan has said that they want to uh, get involved in that kind of fight. Well, Russia then will extend the war to Japan. If Japan and South Korea decide they want to fight North Korea, Russia and China will get involved in that fight. Uh, the world has changed. There's no more American-run bullying going to take place. NATO is no longer going to be able to go and pick off nations and destroy them and remove their leaders from power. Russia will get involved. What does it say about Serbia? What is Russia going to do if NATO makes a move on Serbia because of Kosovo? Russia has said that when international peace and security is threatened, Russia and China will come in. This is the new reality. And again, we're talking about NATO that can't even deploy a brigade to Lithuania in, in shorter than three years. I mean, that's Germany, one of the powerhouses of NATO. They have no ammunition left. 
They have nothing left. France can't deploy a brigade to Ukraine without breaking the bank. They've got no sustainability. This is the reality of NATO. You know, all those airplanes that they want to talk about giving, you know, Greece is going to give, what, 32 F-16s to Ukraine. They're all dead, broken F-16s. I mean, that's like me about bragging about giving away my 1986 Corvette collection. You know, <laughs> it hasn't been, it doesn't run. The engine doesn't work. It's going to cost you a million dollars to repair, but you're going to get a Corvette. Well, no, <laughs> you don't want that Corvette. It doesn't work. All these F-16s people are talking about, these aren't good, brand new, top of the line F-16s. These are broken fighters. Most of them can't fly. How many of those uh, uh, Greek F-16s can get off the ground right now? Not many. They have to be repaired. They have to be brought up to speed. Who's going to pay for that? This can be done on the ground in Ukraine. You're going to put them in uh, you know, the, the, the Frankis Ivanovo airfield. Russia will just totally take it out. The, the stupidity of the people who think that NATO is relevant today is beyond me. One of the key elements of this conflict that led Russia to win is the artillery shell. They were using 150 millimeter during this conflict. And we know that when this conflict started, Ukrainians were using the same caliber. And during this conflict, they sent them 155, 152, if I'm not mistaken. And it was. It seems that it was a mess during this conflict in Ukraine. How do you see this case of Ukrainian army? Look, when the war started, Ukraine had Soviet era artillery, 152 millimeter, 122 millimeter, primarily. Same as the Russians, same caliber. Um, and Ukraine had extensive uh, stockpiles of it. But uh, modern war is artillery intensive. I will just correct you on the thing. I mean, the thing that made Russia win is the Russian soldier not Russian artillery, the Russian soldier. Um, the Russian soldier uses a lot of weapons. Artillery is one of them. But what gives Russia the ability to prevail on the battlefield is the Russian soldier. It's a tougher soldier than the West gives him credit to be. Um, a soldier that can take a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. A soldier that's very competent. And Russia has proven this over the, the centuries. The Russian soldier is what gives the Russian army uh, its, its capabilities. Artillery is a great weapon, and the Russians use it very well, but it's the Russian soldier that does this, not a piece of equipment. It's the blood, the soul, the heart that's attached to the feet and the boot that makes the Russian army what it is today. But Russian artillery, you know, they have a lot of it. Uh, Russia has emphasized artillery fires on battlefield over uh, air power. NATO is a place that does talk about close air support, uh, and artillery and close air support work together in a combined arms fashion. With Russia, close air support, not so much. Artillery, artillery, artillery. So Russia fires a lot more artillery rounds than uh, Ukraine does. And when Ukraine's air power was taken out of the mix, so to speak, as a decisive factor in the battlefield, Ukraine didn't have sufficient artillery to match the Russians. You're dealing with a six to one, 10 to one disadvantage. So the Russians were able to dominate the, the battlefield from a firepower standpoint. And for Ukraine to match it, they had to fire a lot of ammunition. You're burning out barrels. You got to understand that you can't just sit there and fire rounds down range and have that barrel last forever. You're burning out barrels. If you don't have replacement barrels in the facilities where you can replace the barrels, um, you lose the artillery pieces. But they ran out of ammunition long before they ran out of barrels. And so they have guns, 152, 122. They don't have ammunition. The first thing NATO tried to do is buy up the old Warsaw Pact ammunition that was in the former Warsaw Pact nations, Poland, Czech Republic, et cetera, and get those over. The Ukrainians ran through those. They went around the world and tried to buy some they could. But the other thing is um, the artillery systems that the Ukrainians had uh, these Soviet era artillery systems, they also had a range problem. They weren't the longest range systems. The Russians had more modern versions that could outrange them. So West tried to give Ukraine um, 155 millimeter artillery, which is the Western uh, standard um, and, and uh, different calibers to give them longer range. And so the, 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 they, they provided these systems to them. But, um, you know, one of the problems is that they don't give them the, the, the quantities of artillery systems necessary. So the Ukrainians are just burning through the barrels again. And now these systems can't be maintained in Ukraine. They have to be taken out. So become an inefficient system. And the other thing is the 155 artillery shell. NATO never planned. 
remember General Christopher Cavoli said in 2023 about the fighting that the scope and scale of the violence is beyond the imagination. The imagination is what drives everything in military planning. And if you're imagining a conflict for your military, you have to buy the artillery that you're going to stockpile, the artillery shells. So NATO had a stockpile for a certain kind of war, and they would replenish it annually to meet training requirements or to replace um, you know, outdated ammunition. But they weren't building up uh, a war chest. Russia, on the other hand, has the massive war chest, and they've mobilized the defense industry, and they're able to produce the artillery shells, and they're able to purchase artillery shells from North Korea, and they will never run out of ammunition. Ukraine has run out of ammunition. The West has run out of ammunition. There's no ammunition left to give the Ukrainians. They've run out of 155 millimeter artillery shells. So now they have, you know, some NATO uh, guns, no ammunition. They have some old Soviet era guns, no ammunition. Meanwhile, Russia just has their standard Russian guns, they're being upgraded. They've created new systems coming in, great capabilities, but they're never going to run out of ammunition. Um, and so Russia, that's just another area that Russia dominates this uh, this war. Do you think that NATO is learning from this conflict in Ukraine? Because when they send these tanks to Ukraine, they thought that it's going to be a game changer. The land that they're fighting on right now is a flat land. It's totally different from Hill's land. And that makes the difference between the tanks, that that's why the NATO tanks are going to be a good target for Russians. No, I mean, I, I don't agree with that, the, 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 the underlying analysis. Um, you know, the, the terrain in, in Ukraine, yes, is, is different, but it's not different than, uh, for instance, the flat plains of northern Germany, where we were planning on fighting major battles with the Soviets during the Cold War, where many or all of the tanks that are currently equipping NATO, uh, you know, were, were designed to fight. The M1A1 Abrams, the M1 Abrams was designed to fight the Soviets in Germany. The Leopard was designed to fight the Soviets in Germany. The Chieftain was designed to fight uh, the Soviets in Germany. Leclerc was designed to fight the Soviets in Germany. The problem is that for 20 years, we stopped thinking about fighting large scale ground combat in Europe and the tanks went into a warehouse and we didn't train with them. We didn't think them. We didn't upgrade them. We didn't mo uh, modernize their armor. We were so focused on how to kill Afghan wedding parties and how to murder Iraqi civilians that we forgot how to fight a real war. So the problem is that, A, these tanks are old. They're not new tanks. They're old. And two, we haven't upgraded them, modernized them. Um, yes, the, the new U.S. tanks have some applique armor, but the reality is the tank is not a invincible system. Every tank can be destroyed. The mistake we made is that we, we sat there and said our tanks are better. We told lies to ourselves and to the Ukrainians about the superiority of Western technology. Western tanks burn every bit as much as Russian tanks. Um, that's, that's the reality. The other reality is that when you build a tank that's designed for combat in Western Europe, um, you, you know, you, you, you build a tank that, you know, the road network can handle that the bridges can handle. Um, in, in Ukraine, their, their, their infrastructure is not there to handle a 60 ton tank. Uh, and so things will get bogged down, et cetera, but that's okay. Tanks are supposed to survive on, you know, any, anything. It's not the terrain that will defeat the tank. It's the fact that we don't know how to do tank warfare anymore. We haven't trained for it. We haven't practiced for it. The Russians have. They're ready for it. They have the weapons that can destroy our tanks, and they've proven that over and over and over again. Um, you know, that, that's, that's the thing. We just don't know how to do this anymore. We forgot how to do this. We didn't train to do this. Um, and our equipment sucks. It's, you know, the, the, I think, you know, we also allowed ourselves, you know, in, in order to fight the kind of war we were preparing to fight in the 1980s, we had a huge amount of logistics and maintenance capability built in. Um, we don't have that anymore. We've lost all of that. We, we don't operate in core sized elements anymore. We, uh, we operate in brigade size elements where maybe a division headquarters is out there. Uh, core is doing administrative work, but we don't know how to sustain a core size multi-divisional force in the, in the field anymore. Uh, how to sustain the maintenance we've, we've become cheap because that's expensive. So what we do now is we contract everything to civilians back in the rear, but back in the rear doesn't help you in a war where you're grinding through equipment. You need the rapid ability to re repair it and get it back in the battlefield. The Russians have these tremendous depot uh, facilities that they, when things are destroyed or damaged, they pull them out and they re-equip them and they're back in the battle. Um, 
We don't have that. We take things out. We have to have civilian contractors come in and take a long time because they're running up the clock because they're making money. It's all about making money. It's not about doing the right thing. Those Russian conscript soldiers or or the, the the professional mechanics, you know, they're working for a paycheck that the Russian soldier get. They're doing it because it's their job. It's their patriotic duty, and they're doing it well. Different motivating factors too. How many people in the West are fighting for out of a sense of patriotic duty? How many people enlisted in the U.S. Army because they said, I love my country, I want to die for my country? Or did they say, I'm unemployed, I need a job, or I want free college benefits, or I want health care, or I just want to escape a crappy life in the middle of nowhere in America? Um, and now they, you know, they're there in the Army, they join thinking that the you know, worst case, you deployed in the Middle East, etc. Now they're being told, no, you're going to deploy against the Russians, they're going to kill y'all. Because they know the truth. Trust me, the American soldier in that unit knows the reality of what's going on. He sees what it takes to get that tank unit in the field. He sees the incompetence of their leadership as they try to figure out what's going on. He understands that if they go up against the Russia, it's game, set, match, Russia. Um, so, you know, the, I, I don't think we, you know, should try and find an excuse for the incompetence of the West when it comes to armored warfare. It's not about the terrain in Europe. It's about the incompetence of the West. It seems that the United States has started selling arms to Kiev for money. Where does this money come from, in your opinion, if they, they didn't receive it from the West, from the United States? Well, what weapons are you talking about? Because what I've seen is the United States is drawn upon, you know, a couple hundred million dollars here, a couple hundred million dollars there that hadn't been spent before, where they, they squeeze something out of a budget. But we're not we're not providing the Ukrainians with overwhelming amounts of uh, equipment we've we've scraped the bottom of the barrel we've got nothing left and until congress releases this 60 billion dollars uh for ukraine there's going to be nothing for ukraine we have nothing to give ukraine zelensky in an interview just recently he accepted that counteroffensive was not working for ukrainians do you think that he really understands that if trump wins that would be the final point for his administration Or you well, think I mean, if that's his thinking, let's just think about it. Um, if Trump wins, first of all, that means that you're extending this out to November, which means you're extending it out from uh, to to January because Trump will be. You really think Ukraine's going to be here in November and January? I mean, this is delusional thinking on the part of Zelensky. What's the sustainability factor of Ukrainian resistance capacity between now and November? Uh, there's a reason why the Russians, like many Russians who are responsible people, are talking about major changes this summer. There's a reason why um, Ukrainian uh, uh, government, Ukrainian politicians who fled Ukraine in 2014 are talking about possibly coming back to Kiev in 2024, uh, because the, the Ukrainians can't keep this fight up. They can't keep this fight up. There is no plan B. New York Times wrote an article that says that it's a terrible idea to seize the frozen Russian asset. We know that. What does it mean when New York Times talking about this? Do you think that at the end of the day, the Biden administration is getting to the point that it's not a good idea to do this? Well, they know it's not a good idea. New York Times is talking to Wall Street money managers, people who are managing portfolios. If you want the dollar to die instantly, If you want U.S. credibility to be eliminated instantly, go around stealing uh, the, 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 the reserves of nations who have entrusted these reserves to, uh, to Western banks. Um, the, the people will immediately pull out all their money and find other ways to do it. You know, for many years, I, I heard people say um, that no one will walk away from the dollar because they can't afford to. Well, what we've done is if we start stealing your, 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 you know, your, 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 your reserves, um, we've made it impossible for you to stay with the dollar because you can't afford to stay with the dollar. Because what the United States is saying is anytime we have a disagreement with you, we can freeze your assets and steal them. Who wants to do business? Would you put your money in a bank that said, hey, anytime we don't like what you're doing, uh, Scott Ritter, you're on a podcast. We don't like it. Uh, so we're going to freeze your money and take it from you. I'd say, well, I'm not putting my money in your bank anymore. So that's what will happen. If we do this to Russia, nobody will trust the system. All the money will flee and the global economic system uh, dominated by the West will collapse. That's what they're saying. It's not a good idea. You know, banking, you got to have some sort of trust. 
How do you trust a nation that just is willing to steal hundreds of billions of dollars? Steal. We acknowledge it's theft. We have no legal right to freeze these assets, and we definitely have no legal right to steal them. Hell, we're already stealing the profits, you know, because this money's in a bank. It's a lot of money. It's accruing interest. And so we've already taken the interest and given it to the Ukrainians. That's theft. Eventually, we're going to have to pay the Russians back. Eventually, when this all ends, the West is going to have to turn to Russia and say, oh, we're sorry here. We're going to return your money and pay the interest. You say, that will never happen. Ask the Iranians. We froze their assets when the Shah was removed from power in order to finally make good with Iran as part of the, the uh, joint comprehensive program of act, plan of action, the nuclear deal. We had to give them their money back with interest, with interest, because that's the only way the world works. Theft is not acceptable. Russia is not losing this war. Russia is winning this war. Russia is stronger than ever because they now have a relationship with China that's stronger than any treaty. Russia and China have guaranteed that they both will survive whatever the West does to them. And therefore, eventually, as Janet Yellen found out, this economic union that's going to be created between Russia, China, and the developing world is so big that the, that the West is going to either have to learn how to work with them or die because we can't compete with them. Um, and so if we want to learn to work with them, we can't be stealing their money. Uh, the, the, again, the arrogance and stupidity of the anti-Russian crowd. Let me put it this way. If you're in the business of doing global economic analysis, whether it's related to energy security or development or whatever, and you still have a Western-centric point of view, you're wrong. Now, there's a lot of Russophobia out there. There's a lot of Sinophobia you know, out there. There's a lot of prejudice, bias built into the system. Hey, managers, wake up. Fire the people that work for you who are unwilling to open their minds about the reality of Russia and China. Fire them now because you're, they're ruining your company. They're ruining your business. This is a BRICS-centric world now. The world is in transformation. And if you're sitting there talking about, you know, the West, talking about the G7, talking about the G20, talking about whatever garbage the West throws out there that's failing across the board, and you're not talking about BRICS, you're talking about the wrong thing. So you need to engage so that whatever system emerges is a West BRICS system. But if you continue to ignore BRICS, BRICS will continue to ignore the West and develop its own center of gravity independent of the West, and you'll be left behind. And if your job is to do is to manage Western economies, you're just managing them into the garbage dump. Fire the people that aren't open-minded about Russia. That doesn't mean you have to be pro-Russia. doesn't mean you have to be pro-Putin. You just have to be intelligent about it. You have to be knowledgeable about it. If you're not willing to be knowledgeable about Russia, knowledge about Russia, you're sort of useless.